If you missed it live, then you're in luck. You're listening to the Hey Techies Rewind. As a NASCAR crew chief for 17 years, he has earned an impressive resume. 23 NASCAR Winston Cup wins, including two Daytona 500 wins and back-to-back all-star race victories, 21 NASCAR Winston Cup polls, 122 top fives and 209 top tens. He's worn the crew chief hat for great drivers like Ricky Rudd, Ernie Irvin, Davey Allison's famous 28 Texaco Ford, and the famous number three of Dylan Hart Sr., His teams finished in the top 10, an impressive 47% of the time. Now a known TV commentator for Fox, Fox Sports 1 and TNT, as well as a team owner himself, please welcome to the Hey Techie Show, America's Crew Chief, Larry McReynolds. Hey Larry, how are you doing? Oh, doing great. How are you guys doing tonight? We're doing Fantastic. fantastic. Yes, sir. Well, look, I want to tell you, I appreciate this so much. Uh, the, the, I know you didn't know us from Adam's Apple, but uh, we're just uh, good old Alabama guys. And uh, I know you're from Alabama. so. Uh, and, and by the way, roll tide. Yes. We're three weeks from tonight, <laughs> Michigan tide. State. That's so right. We'll see what happens. And we're here at Jacksonville State University. And, and I don't know if you've even ever heard of us, but we're actually in our quarterfinals uh, uh, tomorrow night. For, uh, oh, nice. Yeah, Very so. nice. I know exactly where you guys are at. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, look, Larry, uh, what I want to do is just maybe do a little back, uh, maybe a little history of NASCAR for just a minute, and then we'll move on to, to tech. But uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions here first off. Larry, how did you get bit by the racing bug, and like, what event got your storied career started in NASCAR? Well, it, it's an interesting story, and I'll try to do the abbreviated version. I, I really did not come from any type of a racing background whatsoever. Uh, I was an only child. My mom and dad cared nothing whatsoever about NASCAR. Now, they obviously are, are both deceased now, but they, uh, they were huge fans uh, in, in the late stages of their life after me, my involvement and, and moving on up the ladder. But uh, my grandfather, my mom's dad, was a, a pretty big fan. And my mom's sister, who was really more like a sister to me because she was only 10 years older than I was, she was a race fan. Huh. And every Friday night, the three of us would go down the hill from my grandparents' house to BIR and watch the races every Friday night. Yep. Pretty much from the time they started, and of course they always ended on Labor Day because of turning the infield into a football field. And then when my aunt ended up getting married, uh, her husband was a huge fan. So then the four of us would go every Friday night. And my aunt was actually, she was a little bit of a hot rodder. She always liked hot rod cars and things. Hmm. And I want to say it was probably about 1975, 76. I was still in high school. Uh, We went to the races early one season, and they started a brand-new division called a Street Stock Hobby Division. Uh, it was a simple race car. You you found an old car, you maybe tuned on the engine a little bit, you took the windows out, took the seats out, put a racing seat in it, welded a few row bars in it, put the fuel tank up in the trunk, put a number on the side, and you had yourself a street stock hobby car. Wow. Well, this first night they ran it, they only had two cars the first night, and actually it was a male and a female. Uh, Michael Ray, I can remember it like it was yesterday, and Kathy Speakman out of Huntersville, uh, Huntsville, Alabama. So my aunt said to her husband, I could do that. I'd like to do that. And he kind of, you know, jokingly (laughs) fired back at her and said, well, tell you what, go out and find you some sponsors and we'll build you one. And her husband, uh, Butch Mears, was a a pretty good mechanic. Yeah. So anyhow, uh, she called his bluff. And she went out and rounded up more sponsors than we could almost put on a race car. And Hmm. a lot because of being a female in a man's sport. And, and, of course, we're not talking about a lot of money. And so, lo and behold, my racing career was, was up and going. Wow. And uh, I didn't know a lot about cars in general, but my, my uncle uh, taught me a lot, and I'll always be very indebted to him. And, and you're right. Uh, racing is like a disease. It gets in your bloodstream, and there's no getting <laughs> it out. And my aunt didn't race with a ton of success, so I moved on and started helping some some late model racers in the area. Uh, Bobby Ray Jones was the owner out of Minor, Alabama. Uh, Richard Orton drove the car for him. Uh, 
Dave Mater the third drove it. We had a lot of success. We won a lot of races around the southeast. And I finally made the decision. Uh, I was about 20 or 21 years old, and I made the decision, you know, I'd really like to do this for a living. And so I felt like, okay, it's not going to happen in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm going to have to move to the Carolinas if I want this to happen. So in September of 1980, uh, I packed up a U-Haul, looked behind my little green Pinto, Mm -hmm. to the Carolinas I went. And my mom and dad looked at me and and said, this is the craziest thing (laughs) we've ever seen. You'll be back in six months. You'll be broke and you'll be hungry. We will feed you, but we're not going to bail you out of debt. And I said, you know, as much as y'all are probably right, and as much as I always respect your opinion, I have to go do this. I have to at least right. give it a try. Right. And so I'm proud to say 35 years later, I'm I'm still here and, and things are going pretty well. Yeah, I, I, I know uh, another uh, um, a radio guy I listened to, he, was, he would always say his dad has passed now, and he said his dad would not believe his life. And I bet you parent, your parents might not believe the kind of life you have now because of NASCAR, I'm sure. Well, and, and, and my mom eventually, my mom and dad were divorced, and, and my mom eventually moved up here before she passed away. Okay. And, and like I say, they were not race fans whatsoever when I first started. Right. Uh, but before they passed away, there probably was not a bigger race fan than, oh. than my dad especially. Oh, sure. The, his son, no, no doubt about that. Well, hey, what about the Davy Allison era? You, of course, were his crew chief, and a lot of water obviously has rushed under the bridge since then. But looking back, Larry, what stands out in that 11-win season? Well, the, the 1992 season, uh, I think if you look back at the entire 60-something-plus year history of NASCAR, there has never been a driver and a team that has went through so many highs and so many lows as we did in that 1992 season, uh, we we had an unbelievable year. We we won five races, including the the, the Daytona 500. Right. We won the All Star race. We led the points a good part of the season. Uh, we had the points lead headed into the final race of the year. That year, there was Atlanta Motor Speedway and got caught up in a wreck and, yep. and ended up losing the championship. But all the things we went through, uh, I tell people all the time, we almost were into a pattern in the spring. We would win one week and wreck one week, win one week and wreck one week, and then one week we figured out how to do both in the same night <laughs> to wreck crossing the finish line to, to win the, the all-star race there at yeah, Charlotte. Yeah. And just a, a, a lot of things hard on Davey that year. Uh, Clifford was killed in an in a Xfinity Series wreck at Michigan in August of 92. Uh, Davey's grandfather, Pop Allison, passed away in the spring of 92. Mm. Uh, Davey cracked some ribs big time at a crash at Bristol in the spring. Uh, the the wreck at Pocono where he barrel rolled 11 times and had to have surgery on his arm, and we had to Velcro his hand the next week to the shifter to be able to start the race at Talladega and turn the car over to Bobby Hillen Jr. Uh, again. It, it would take the rest of the night no, and the morning to describe yeah. everything we went through right. in, in 1992. But You know, I don't think it's coincidental that the most success I had with any driver was the driver I had the closest relationship with, and that certainly would be uh, Davey Allison. I had great relationships with every driver I worked with, but Davey and I were best friends. Our our families were close. We we attended mass together. We, We both are practicing Catholics. In fact, we had our two sons baptized together, and Linda and I, are Robbie Allison's godparents, and Davey and Liz are Brandon, our son's godparents. So just a very close relationship. So, you know, on July 13th of 1993, not only did I, I lose the race right. car driver that I was working closely with uh, as he was killed in that helicopter crash at Talladega, I absolutely lost my best friend that day. Yeah, that was a sad day Yeah, for, for all of NASCAR. I'll say this as a as a racing fan. I was I was pretty young when that happened, but to me, that's when NASCAR died for me. And I, I mean, I it sounds I, I get choked up about it because I mean, I was that was something my dad and I shared, and that was that was who I was a fan of, and I just liked liked his character. I liked him. I mean, I was I was young, uh, and I, I that racing hadn't been the same since for me. No, he he was he was the blue collar racer in a, in a lot 
due to how he was brought up by, by his mom and dad, Bobby and Judy Allison. Just a great person, loved the race fans, uh, loved life, loved his family, loved God, just, just a good person all around. And, you know, I, I, I never try to forecast what might have been, but, but I would certainly like to think, had that tragic accident not happened in July of 1993, that, that Davy Allison would have a multitude more wins. And I would like to think that he would be a multi-time Sprint Cup Series oh, yeah. champion. Oh, yeah. I think that's no question there. I agree with that. So we got a little history behind us. Uh, so I want to shift gears and talk engines of today, if you don't mind. Now, the power plant in every car has guidelines, and as as you know, just like every other part on the race car. Uh, that being said, are there areas that technology can differ, say, from a Yates Ford engine to a Hendrick Chevy engine to, say, even a Gibbs Toyota engine? Well, you know, the the, the box of rules that, that NASCAR has uh, on, on everything about our sport, but, but in, in particular engines, uh, it, it's hard to get an advantage. Yeah, there, there's no question, you know, uh, some some engines may have a little more top end. Some engines may have a little better bottom end. I know for a number of years, uh, the Ford engines back in the day um, didn't have a lot of bottom end, but they had real good top end horsepower, and that's why some of the bigger tracks, I think we, we seem to, to perform well, like the, the Michigans, the Poconos, the Atlantas, the Charlotte. But I'd say today, even though each manufacturer <clears throat> has to have their own footprint uh and landscape of of right. uh, the engine that that we run in these sprint cup series cars nascar works pretty hard to make sure that nobody has a huge advantage they <clears throat> randomly will take engines and it's very random you know it right. may be after a martinsville race it may be after a race at charlotte and they might take one or two engines from each manufacturer and take them back to the nascar r&d center and, and dyno them they, themselves just to make sure uh, that there's not a huge advantage that any one manufacturer has. Um, the one thing that, that happened, uh, I think we're in our third or fourth year, uh, and I, I, I never thought we'd really get to this point. And, and there's no question, there's a lot of areas that we're probably behind times with technology mm-hmm. because up until three or four years ago, we were still racing a four-barrel, naturally aspirated carburetor. I was going to ask you about that, yeah. That's what we've been racing forever. End of 2011, right? Yeah. yeah. So we're, you know, let's see, I, I guess we're we're into uh, headed into our fourth year right. with electronic fuel injection. And that, that definitely, I think everybody was a little bit leery of it at first, <clears throat> but I think it's definitely opened the door uh, for a lot of new things to happen because, A, the mapping uh, that these teams can do. You know, there's a lot of race mornings. Uh, the the crew chiefs, the engineers, and the engine tuners will debate, okay, do we want to go ahead and have full power and not worry about fuel mileage? Or do we wait, maybe want to pull a little power out with the thought that this race may come down to a fuel mileage race? Or at a place like Martinsville or a place like Richmond, some of the short tracks or road courses where you really fight spinning the tires off the corner on into a run, you know, taking a little bit of the power away to try to help that situation. And then, of course, with the ECU, the electronic control unit that's on the dash now, right. you know, something I thought I'd never see in a NASCAR Sprint Cup Series garage area, uh, the engine tuner no longer looks at spark plugs. He no longer pulls a timing light out. He plugs a laptop yeah. into that ECU after each run, and there's a ton of data that they can see, and even post race, there's a lot of data that can they can see. And, and if you have an engine failure, they can plug the laptop into it, look at the data, and see maybe when something started actually started to happen with that engine that led to a catastrophic failure. I think you've been reading my questions before I even got to them, Larry. <laughs> this, this is great because I was going to ask you about telemetry. I mean, where is NASCAR on telemetry? I know other sports that uh, racing sports they allow telemetry some in the race, but I mean NASCAR. You think they're ever going to do that or never say never, right? Because one thing that that Brian France and the group of NASCAR right now are trying to do, and and, and the biggest thing they they'd love to, to take ne- not technology. A lot further than sure. we are right now, but there's a there's 
something that goes along with technology, and it's a big dollar sign, and that's cost to the owners of the sport. And, you know, for, for my 35 years of being here and well before that, NASCAR looks at a lot of things, but the three major areas they look at is the competition. Do we have good competition on the track? And they look at safety. We can never quit looking at safety. And I think Kyle Busch's accident at Daytona back in February is proof of that. And then the third thing, in no particular order, is the cost of this sport. You know, the the last year I was a crew chief at Richard Childress Racing, our budget for that 31 team uh, was $7.5 million. Uh, Spend it ahead now today to 2015, headed to 2016, that's about a fourth of the budget that the – these Good teams have it's not like you're running a lot more races you're running maybe one or two more races than we did in 2000 yeah. but it's just where technology has went uh, we're a very we've become a very engineer and driven sport so to sit here and say you know we have telemetry but only for our viewers pleasure we, right. we have it with the tv broadcast uh i don't know that we'll see it anytime soon but you know, we, we've got a digital dash that's coming out next year. Ask uh, you about some that. teams played with it this year, and there's going to be a lot more information on that digital dash. Probably one of the most important things for a driver to look at, uh, he'll be able to see the four air pressures in his tires, oh. which is a bit of a safety situation because if he sees the air pressure starting to go down, he knows he's got a, 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 a tire that's going flat. Seriously. They're really so that's really going to be, be a big it. deal next year. Wow, that is going to be huge. That will because right now, I mean, if the listeners listen, they don't know. They really have to just feel that feel whether they're getting a flat or not. And, and you always have the question: Okay, am I feeling something else, or am I really feeling a flat tire? And of course, the crew chief, especially under green flag conditions, you're wanting to know: Are you sure? Because the last thing you want to do is make a green flag pit stop to change what you think's a flat tire and you end up finding out there's no flat on the car that the driver just was feeling some handling start to go away on the car. So, right. you know, this is going to be a lot like the the sensors that uh, a lot of passenger cars have. Uh, look, I, I don't want to go too far back, but looking back at what you were talking about, about electronic fuel injection, do you think that's been the correct decision looking back at it now? I, I do. I do because I think it has saved a lot of engine failures and I think it has, has maybe even even the playing field a little bit. Yeah. I know for a fact Dale Earnhardt Jr. is one of many drivers, but probably one that's most notably really embraced the, the data because now he can look at the data, the throttle trace, uh, the, the braking zone. He can look at his data, and he can compare it to his teammates' data. He can compare it to Casey Kane or Jimmy Johnson or Jeff Gordon. He's been able to look at that data, and he's been one of the drivers that has really embraced this technology because I think it's something that he really has enjoyed being a part of. Okay, yeah. Uh, Now, I wonder about, I'm assuming, uh, I guess I'm going to show my ignorance here, Larry, I'm assuming the EFI has changed also fuel mileage calculations, yes? Possibly? Well, it, it... it has, but a lot because of that mapping, uh, okay. you know, because of, of the tuning. I, I think the tuning is a lot more precise. And, of course, you know, we talk about fuel mileage races, and, and we, ha- we do have a lot of them. But I'll, as a crew chief, I went into every race thinking, <laughs> yeah. okay, this could be a fuel mileage race. I didn't care if it was Martinsville, Daytona, Atlanta, Charlotte. You know, you, you started almost thinking about fuel mileage, at the drop of the green flag. Uh, but I think what it has done, it has helped them calculate it a lot closer because you do have that data that you're able to look look, look at, and you do truly know, you know, what, what's been going on with the fuel mileage. And, of course, the biggest thing with, with, with electronic fuel injection, and I, I don't mean to, to talk, talk down to people that's a lot smarter than me, <laughs> but – it only sends fuel to the cylinders when the cylinder says, hey, I need some fuel over here, where the carburetor is constantly sending it all the time right. if the driver is on the throttle. Right. So, it would, it, I mean, from that standpoint, it's definitely more efficient. No question a- Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think we've actually seen fuel mileage get just a little better uh, with it. But, of course, that's been a little artificial this past season because we went with the tapered spacer this year to pull the power back just a little bit because uh, we're using the same engine that we've been using for years, 
but where technology has carried it, where when I was with Robert Yates, we were making somewhere around 650 to 700 horsepower, spin it ahead to today, realistically, the, the, the same design of engine, even before electronic fuel injection, these guys were making over 900 horsepower. So finally NASCAR, you know, in the perfect world, they would have loved to have just made a smaller engine, take yeah. cubic inches away. But I go back to what I said a while ago. Whenever you do something like that, cost. all you're doing is just killing the cost of the sport. So the simplest thing to do is put that tapered spacer on there. That that took about somewhere around 100 horsepower away. Now, help me understand this. That spacer, is that anything like the um, restrictor plate, or is that something totally different? Uh, it, it, it's totally different. It, it somewhat serves the same purpose, Okay. but you don't lose as much throttle response with the tapered spacer as you do the restrictor plate like we run at Daytona and Talladega because we still run the restrictor plate at sure. Daytona and Talladega, but unlike with the carburetor where it restricted fuel and air, with electronic fuel injection, it just simply restricts airflow. Air, right. Because, I mean, they would be well up over 200 easily. Well, oh, it, it, without, the, without the restrictor plate at Daytona and Talladega, you couldn't race at those speeds. Yeah. It, there is no way you could race these stock cars. You would just be hanging on because NASCAR did some testing. Uh, and, you know, we were seeing speeds well over 220, close to 225 miles per hour to, at, the, at the end of the straightaways uh, without that restrictor plate. So as much as we don't like the restrictor plate, the drivers don't like it, it's a 100% necessary evil because you cannot race these cars at those kind of speeds. Right. Now, you're, just, you're just hanging on. Now, the movie Days of Thunder, a fun film to watch for sure, but – in the movie, Rubbin' is racing. I think it was kind of oversold because, really, you beat your car up that much, it's probably not likely you'll win the race anymore for aero alone, right? Is Yeah, that, that was for entertainment purposes only. And I always enjoyed Days of Thunder, and it still comes on periodically. Right. <clears throat> I'll still sit down and watch it and enjoy it just as much as I did, you know, back in the day when it first came out. <clears throat> but, yeah, you do that kind of rubbing really and truly at any racetrack. You may get by a little bit at a road course. You may get by a little bit at Martinsville or Bristol or Richmond, our short tracks. But anywhere else, if you do that kind of rubbing, it's going to completely destroy the aerodynamics of these cars. And these cars, they totally, 100% thrive on, on aerodynamics. Yeah. Now, and, and that's one thing that I've noticed. NASCAR is really heavy on that. There's very little wiggle room on the aero stuff. I mean, I think I noticed... In one of the races toward the end, Jimmy Johnson, uh, they they had him stop because it like his tire man pulled the the fender out a little bit or pushed it in so that it would <clears throat> get an advantage. Yeah, th- there was a, a lot of that going on in 2014, especially at the end of of the year. Uh, and I think what happened, it got so far out of control, NASCAR couldn't really do anything about it in 2014. I mean, these guys were. Where take the jack man would take his knee and cave the side in to give more flair. Uh, the tire guys would would pull the front of the quarter panels out in front of the rear tires, would pull the fenders out, and a, a little bit's a lot. I mean, these guys were probably the things they were doing in 2014. They were probably adding 100, 150 pounds of downforce, total downforce to the car. But before 2015, NASCAR said, okay. New season, new sheet of paper, no more. If you do it and we catch you, you're going to come back to pit road and you're going to fix it and you're going to be a serve a penalty too. And that's what happened. The, the jack man for the 48 car right. took his knee and caved in the, the right side of Jimmy Johnson's car to give it more downforce in the right rear. And not only did they make him come back to pit road and fix it, after they went back racing, he had to do a drive-through penalty right. uh, that pretty much destroyed his his, right. his race. Now, speaking of that, I, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but one thing that has done, they they implemented a new pit road re- referee system this year, didn't they, with cameras? And uh, I think there's still a little bit of a human factor in there. Have you had a chance to look at it this year? You know, I, I really engage myself. Uh, in, in that, you know, they they played with it for ten races the end of last year. Uh, they didn't utilize it as far as officiating the race, 
but but they were running the full system the okay. whole time and I, and they were good enough to let me go in the trailer at Talladega uh in the fall of last year and I sat in there and and watched the whole system for two thirds of the race and as much as I think everyone was a little bit scared of it and a little bit leery of it I think now that we've done it for a year everybody is embracing it because mm-hmm. it's 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 black and white and, and the one thing that, that I always try to clear up, NASCAR didn't change any pit road rules. Right. They just have a much more sophisticated way and a more precise way of, of policing the rules that's been in place forever. The rule has always been in place that you can't remove equipment from the pits. The rule has always been in place a crew member cannot go across the wall into the car is, is one pit away. The rule has always been in the place a driver cannot drive through more than three pits in right. his box or leaving. It's just been hard to officiate. Now it's black and white. It's kind of like the pit road speed. Yeah, We, we came about pit road speed uh, in 1991, and the way they policed it is they had two or three officials on top of the, of the, the top grandstands with stopwatches randomly clocking different drivers through di- different segments. They knew how long it should take you to go through that segment at the advertised pit road speed. You may go a full race and never get never get checked. You may get checked three pit stops in a row. Then all of a sudden, a few years ago, pit road speed was still there. It was still the same, but then they put the transponders on the car. They put the, the loops on pit road, and now every driver... Every stop, every segment is is monitored as far as his pit road speed. And it's it's black and white. I, I've been in there and I've watched this system in the NASCAR control tower and they have this big screen with every driver and as you drive down pit road it, it pops up each segment and it, it's either green or it's red. You don't even have to look at the number. Right. You know if it's red that driver was speeding in that segment. And in the other thing that's a little bit artificial, for example, pit road speed at Talladega is 55 miles per hour. NASCAR gives these drivers up to 60 miles per hour. In other words, you can run, you know, 50, 59.9999. Right. So whenever someone is busted for speeding, that means they were at least five miles per hour over the advertised speed limit. You know, you may we may say on the broadcast he, he was three tenths of a miles per hour too fast. Actually, what that means he was five point three miles per hour too fast over the pit road speed. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, speaking of the of the pit road speed, it got a few people this year. Seemed like a little more than it did last year. I don't have the specs in front. I mean, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but it seemed like they 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 tagged a bunch of people this year for it. Well, the, the the racing on on the racetrack is is so intense right now. But what teams and drivers and crew chiefs and pit crew members have figured out is the competition on pit road is about as tough there as it is on the racetrack. Yeah. And it's like Earnhardt used to tell me, I can pass them a whole lot easier on pit road than I can out there on that racetrack. Right. And what he was trying to tell us, give me a good pit stop and make me up some spots. And I think it's one reason we started seeing more and more mistakes made by the driver and by the crew. We started seeing drivers speeding a little bit more. Uh, We started seeing more loose wheels. We started seeing more mistakes made because, again, these guys are not looking for a second or two. They are maybe only looking for a tenth or two tenths because if you can pick your your trip to pit road up, including the driver getting down pit road and off pit road plus the pit stop, if you can pick up two or three tenths, you may pick up four or five spots on that pit stop. And it's, again, to Earnhardt's point, a lot easier to pass them there than out there on that racetrack. Yeah, and, and pit stops in general have picked have uh, have really picked up the time as far as quick now over the years. I mean, th- I guess they've really gotten better at the wrenches for one thing, I suppose. That technology's come quite a long way. Well, technology has a come a long way for sure, just like everything else about our sport. You know, whether it's aerodynamics, whether it's ch- chassis setup, whether it's engine horsepower, and just going down the list. 
But to me, one of the things that, that kind of probably goes, I won't say unnoticed, but probably doesn't get noted enough, is how much pit stops have picked up. Uh, when I was in the, first came into sport in the 80s, I was a jack man, and if we could change four tires and dump, at that point, 22 gallons of fuel, and we could get somewhere 20 seconds or maybe a little under, we were going to have the best stop on pit road, no question. Spin it ahead to the day, they're still doing the same function. They're still changing four tires. Mm-hmm. Each wheel still has five lug nuts. You're only dumping 19 gallons of fuel, but, you know, we're talking two or three gallons less. So what has picked it up from 20 seconds, 21 seconds, to 11 and 12 seconds? Yeah, jacks are quicker, air wrenches are better, but the biggest difference is the people. Yeah. And the, and the way I explain it, when I first came into sport, my early years as a crew chief, we wanted to hire a good mechanic or a good fabricator. Okay, let's go out back and see if you can change a tire, or jack a car, or dump fuel. Today, teams are hiring strictly good tire changers, good jack men, good gas men. And there's a, most of the major teams, that's their job on that race team. They don't work on the race car. They are a professional tire changer, a professional yeah. jack man, a professional fuel man, and they have workout programs. They have uh, pit crew coaches, pit crew trainers. Joe Gibbs is the one that has taken it to a whole new level. I think he has over there for his four race teams, I think they have two trainers and two coaches, and they even have scouts. They will go out and watch other racing divisions to see if they maybe see a tire changer they like or they see a, a fuel man or jack man. And where back in the day, the driver, maybe the crew chief, was the only two members of the team that was under contract. Today, you can about bet with most of the major teams, all of those major cr- pit crew members that go across that wall, you better believe they're under a pretty tight contract. Wow. I, I, th- I think I read one time or at least saw a special on it. Some of them are maybe even former NFL players that, that they've hired on to, to do some of that. We have a lot of of some college athletes, but, yeah, there are some professional athletes. Uh, I know there's one team, um, and forgive me for for not remembering which team, uh, the Jackman played in the the Canadian Hockey League, Ah. Professional Hockey League. But, yeah, there's a lot of of ex-college football players that that are part of these teams these pit crews because they are truly athletes if you don't think they're athletes oh, right. you try to change four tires and or two tires you know each changer in 11 seconds or try holding uh, a 90 pound fuel can above your shoulder and stepping across the wall or carrying two 50 or 60 pound tires one under each arm if you don't think they're athletes boy you need to try that i think you'll change your mind mm-hmm. yeah i don't doubt that well larry uh just, I guess, sort of in. Um, I know you you probably got to go and and sort of closing this up. I, I I've been so appreciative of you calling and and talking with us tonight. But now looking at the big picture, as far as owners and the crew chiefs and the drivers, what in your opinion in the future going forward do you think that they're going to get the biggest technology boost? Say like an engine, aero package, telemetry, wind tunnel, you know, transmissions, maybe chassis setups. What do you think's gonna maybe be the next thing where the sport's really gonna get a technology boost? Well, it's gonna be an interesting year this year because, you know, as I said earlier, <clears throat> one of my comments, we these cars have become very aero dependent. And these teams, over the years, through engineering, through wind tunnel, they they have learned how to use the chassis setup to to benefit the the the, aero, the aerodynamics of the car. You know, by putting a big front sway bar in it, you keep the front end nice and flat and keep the front sealed off. By keeping a big right rear spring in it, you, you keep that right rear corner hiked up in the air that helps the rear downforce of the car. But it's going to be an interesting year because one thing that NASCAR did this past season, and I I applaud them for doing it, is you can go test with as many cars and as many drivers as you want, but you really never learn what you really need to learn because it's a test. 
But when you put these, these teams and these drivers in a situation where they're racing a particular package in the race, and it's for points, it's for a trophy, it's for a win, it's for prize money, you're going to get you're going to get all they've got. So what NASCAR did during the summer months is they played around with some aero packages. Uh, we tried a, uh, a high drag package with a big, big rear spoiler, a big radiator pan uh, that increases front downforce and, of course, the spoiler rear downforce. We ran that at Michigan and Indianapolis. Really didn't have great results. But what they did do at the Kentucky race in July and then the Southern 500 at Darlington Labor Day weekend, we tried a very low downforce package, uh, which has a small rear spoiler, a very small splitter and radiator pan, a lot less downforce than we've raced over the last few years. And we had good racing at Kentucky. We had good racing at Darlington. And now that's the package that we will race full-time in 2016. Now, remember, we won't see it until race number two okay, at Atlanta yeah, right. because Daytona and Talladega have their own aero package. But this is something a lot of the drivers have been wanting uh, because they, they want to feel like they have more control in, sure. in their day. Where I'm not saying the cars drive good or been driving good because, you know, you still have to be – a special talent to, to drive a, uh, a Sprint Cup Series race car at the speeds they race at, but these drivers feel like they have more control now. And then Goodyear has had to create a tire that goes along with this aero package because I always look at our racing, look at it like a four-cornered box. And one of those corners is the racetrack itself. And you know what? We're, we're locked into that. We can't change that. Whatever the racetrack conditions are at Atlanta when we go there, it is what it is. There's nothing you can do to change that. The other corner is horsepower. And I think NASCAR is pretty comfortable with where we're at right now with this tapered spacer and where the horsepower is at. But the other two corners are two that has to work together. And that's, that's the two that NASCAR has been working on a lot lately, and that's aerodynamics and the Goodyear tire. So what they're going to do in 2016, we're going with this low downforce package that's going to put more in the driver's hand. And then Goodyear is going to give the teams and the drivers a grippier, a softer tire, has more grip. But there's, there's no free lunch. When you have more grip, the further you go in a run, it starts to lose grip and starts to slide around more. And I think that's going to that's gonna make more premium on pit stops. I think you're going to see more teams when the caution comes out. Instead of staying out or just changing two tires, you're going to come to pit road like we did for years back in the day, and you're going to change four tires. Uh, to, to, to answer, though, your question, what, what's next, I, I don't know. You, okay. you know, I tell people all the time, uh, it's unbelievable how much our sport has changed in every area say, over the last 10 years, and I don't see how in the world it could change that much again the next 10 years, but I promise you, if you and I do the same radio show in 10 years, we'll be talking about how much has changed the last 10 years. It's it's an it's a ever-moving target and an ever-moving sport, but at the end of the day, the biggest thing we have to do is we have to please our race fans because when we please them, that means they're going to go out there and watch the races and they're going to tune in to the broadcast on Sunday. We got about three minutes here. We got somebody that chatted a question. They were curious about what tech, tech from NASCAR, and you could just name one thing, that has translated into cars we drive. And I know that's a long list. Well, I think safety has definitely been one of them. But let me say this I'm going to flip it around. Technology that came from a passenger car that we are slowly seeing more and more in Sprint Cup or in NASCAR is a lot of passenger car tires have multi-zones on them. In other words, you have a zone for dry, Mm -hmm. you have a zone for wet, and then you have a zone maybe for like ice and snow. Well, what Goodyear has done with that technology is several racetracks we go to, the inner three or four inches – is a little harder compound because that's the part of the tire that takes the most right. abuse. It's for durability. And then the outer 8 to 10 inches 
is a softer compound for grip. So there's there's a, an example of where actually passenger car technology in the in the form of a, of a Goodyear tire actually transformed a little different technique, but actually was used in racing over the last couple of years. Oh, okay. Well, that's great. Yeah, that I I hadn't thought about that. Go, but it looked like it goes both ways. So, it, it, yeah. it absolutely. It's a two way street and. You know, it's it's one of the reasons that I think, you know, manufacturers spends the number of dollars they do in the sport, of course, is to, to intrigue the fans, and hopefully they'll sell Toyotas or Chevrolet or Fords on, on Monday yeah. after a race on Sunday, but also, I think, to, to shoot technology back and forth. Right. Well, look, we really appreciate this. It's been so nice to talk to you, and um, I thank you so much for calling us and being our guest, and I'm so glad to work this out, so... Uh... We really super appreciate it. Well, I, I'm I'm glad we could too. I, I know we tried a couple of times, and of course during the season, I, it's tough. Uh, it's an ever moving target with me with the different things that that I have going on. And right. then my son got married right after the race at Homestead, so oh, things okay. were kind of out of control. Uh, to some degree, it, 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 with <laughs> all that going on, and I'm glad we could finally uh, finally make this work. Well, all right. Well, maybe we can hear from you next year sometime, maybe before the season starts, and you can give us a, a run-up to the new season. So maybe well, something we'll like that. we'll try to do that because it'll be here before you know I it. Know. Because I know. Uh, because I have this little countdown I do on <laughs> Twitter, and it's 73 days from as we sit here. In fact, 73 days from right now, we will know – who won the 2016 Daytona 500? Wow. Mm, my goodness. It'll be here like a blink, right? It, it will. And you can follow that countdown on, on my Twitter. And I love for the fans to follow me. Love your comments. Absolutely. Love your question. I try to answer as many questions as I, as I can. And you can follow me at Larry Mac 28 That's at Larry Mac 28 Thank you so much. And LarryMcReynolds.com. Yes, so, sir. All right. Well, Larry, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you have a great evening. Well, y'all do the same, and uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to to everyone out there, to you guys, and to everyone listening. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Hey Techie Show is produced by Mike Stedham and co-produced by The Guru. Station manager is Billy Dunn. Join us again next time for another exciting installment of The Hey Techie Show. It's going to be great, maybe.